I think many people have noticed a tendency for Marxists to deny the reality of, and, and maybe this is an inaccurate reading, of, of, you can clarify this, but to deny the reality of differences in ability, natural differences in ability between people. And, uh, it, but the conceit of your book that you published, uh, I think two years ago, right? The Cult of Smart is that the left, in order to um, actually meet its own criteria for justice needs to acknowledge the reality that some people are born more talented, more intelligent. Um, some people have, co- we, we have strengths and weaknesses naturally, cognitively, physically, and in, in every way, and that we have to recognize that. So uh, what, what was your inspiration for uh, writing that book and how did that gel with your intellectual past? So um, I was in grad school um, and I had joined a field that um, I really didn't believe in anymore. Um, I thought that the field was fundamentally about teaching the teaching of writing and it really wasn't. It had developed a whole bizarre and esoteric sort of theoretical um, view on what writing was and it wasn't concerned with uh, um, what happens in classrooms. Um, and so I was, um, kind of despondent cause I was in a PhD program. Um, and my, you know, f- feeling like my work was not wanted. So I really started to do a lot of education, um, uh, policy research, uh, a lot of education, um, uh, research methods, except, et cetera. I also was teaching all the time and, um, it was becoming just more and more clear that with every group of students I got, even, you know, the, I was teaching, I taught at the University of Rhode Island and then Purdue University. And even though, um, you know, those are public universities, so they're a little less selective, they still, I'm st- we're still getting a, a screened out set of students. In other words, the selection process for those universities has screened out the lowest performing students. Um, it was still clear, uh, even without like a random sample, that some kids showed up to college on day one having, you know, a, a much stronger grasp of the basic underlying skills that they needed. And then a whole a lot of students not only were poorly prepared for, for college, they did not want to be there. Mm. Here's a um, conversation I mentioned in the book that um, really uh, uh, sat with me for a long time, which is that I was talking to a kid who was a classic case of a kid who rarely came to class, was always behind on his work. Um, you know, he didn't, uh, he clearly just did not want to be there. And I talked to him and I, you know, I, I got around to saying like, look, man, like, um, I don't, college is voluntary, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to be here. There's mm-hmm. other things you can do. And he said, um, well, what am I going to do? Like join my dad in the fishing industry. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, which he said is like a, it, I, ironically, because, you know, Rhode Island's fishing industry has been contracting for forever, mm-hmm. right? It was, you know, to him, like he was saying that an indication of it being like a dying industry, right? Not a growth industry. And um, so many of the students that I knew um, were in college purely because they felt they had no other choice. And so you have this skill mismatch between the kind of skills that college wants to uh, inculcate in people in the skills that people come in with, but also you have a lack of want to because people feel they have no other choice. And I would contrast that to an earlier period of American life, which is um, you have the kind of fabled factory at the edge of town for decades in America, you know, sort of from, let's say, the end of uh, World War One to uh, 1980-ish, say, when it starts to get dismantled. You, just, you know, Bruce Springsteen has sung a hundred songs about this, mm-hmm. right? Um, there were industry, there's manufacturing, um, that, um, allowed somebody to get a job where there was the possibility of owning a home, owning a car, putting a couple kids through school that didn't require a college degree. Um, and that was another path. That was another way out. Certain, uh, places like Detroit were built on this promise, right? They were built on the existence of this kind of job. Often those jobs were unionized, um, and, um, what happened was we closed the factories down. So, um, over time, those jobs, um, dramatically declined again, mostly starting in the eighties and continuing on for a couple of decades after that. Um, and they declined uncontroversially because of automation. So that's the uncontroversial reason is because we got better at, um, 
making machines that could do the roles that humans once did. So, you know, people sometimes say, we used to make things in this country. The United States is still a manufacturing powerhouse, but we employ a small fraction of the number of people we used to employ, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because automation was so effective that we were didn't need those jobs anymore. And then the more controversial thing is the role of offshoring. So pushing uh, jobs to Mexico, uh, to China, to Bangladesh, et cetera. Um, obviously, I'm not in a position to adjudicate uh, how true that is, but that is certainly what, what some people say. And so you have this whole way of life, this, um, uh, <clears throat> this vision of being able to go to the factory at the edge of town, get that job. And it might not be glamorous and it might not be an opportunity to ever be a superstar, but it provided that these jobs provided living wages for families. And this is how we created the American expectation of the house with the white picket fence and the car in the garage and the 2.5 kids. And what, right. Um, and so one of the, th the things that just became eminently clear to me was that, you know, there was always these doomsday statistics about college. I mean, globally, you know, throughout the system, we're still seeing only about half the people who who start uh, uh, graduate on time. Um, there's all kinds of reports about students not learning anything while they're there. Mm -hmm. There's the crushing student that that people are graduating with. Um, it became clear to me that like the, the ultimate culprit of all of this stuff was that um, we were asking to to fit uh, square pegs into round holes. Because there's all different kinds of ways to be useful in uh, the economy and as a human being, but there's not a lot of ways to be particularly useful if you're all forcing everyone into that college pipeline. I mean, the system, if, if you look, listen to what the policymakers are saying, what's coming out of the think tanks and foundations, et cetera, their vision for success is always like taking an under, underprivileged kid and we're going to train him up to be, you know, smart at math and send him to Stanford so he can mm -hmm. then be a Google engineer. Mm -hmm. right? But that's just not a mass path. It's mm -hmm. just not a path that's actually ever going to be able to support everyone moving forward. Um, and I thought that the first step to fixing this is to stop treating smart as like the lodestone of human value. So mm -hmm. I tell a story in the book. I was at a, a cookout um, when I was in grad school. And uh, there was a lot of grad students who were international students. And there was a guy I knew uh, from China and his wife and his two kids were there. And the wife was bragging about her older son and talking about how he's the tops in math and how he's in a robotic, robotics club and how he, you know, he always solves everything you know, really well academically. <laughs> and then her younger son ran by making like funny noises with his mouth. And she said, that one is maybe not so smart. Um, and I could see, and I kind of went like, ooh, I kind of like, ooh, you know, I got mm. this like, uh, uh, I clenched up a little bit and I could see other people, other American people around me sort of clenching up too, because that's just not a thing you say about your kid. Mm -hmm. But when I thought about it later on that day, it's like, you know, if she had said that he wasn't a good athlete, I wouldn't have cared, right? If she had said that, um, he wasn't uh, going to be a great visual artist, fine. If she said he didn't have an ear for music, fine. None of that would have phased me at all, right? But it's with smart and with smart alone that we treat it as this totalizing system, right? Like as the the sole criterion of human value. And it's that that I was trying to attack in my book. Yeah, so... That that is something I have thought about a lot, and I've, I've I'm not really sure I've gotten the chance to talk about it with someone who is in this realm. Because so you and I are both writers. We're both you know writers that are one degree of separation away from you know probably fifty different people that we both know just from like being plugged into this niche little world that that we're in. Um, in the broader scheme of humanity. And, but in this world, intelligence is, uh, it is central, right? In, in this particular profession, if you are, um, if you're a wordsmith, if you're an analyzer of social issues, if you work at all with numbers and understanding statistics, you know, intelligence makes, uh, intelligence is, is of great benefit 
But, you know, and so as a result, I think people in our world sometimes take it for granted that intelligence is the most important thing. Um, and just in general, you know, people who've been to college are likely to tell you to go to college. Is that because it's the right decision for you or is it because they and everyone they know went to college, right? right. And, you know, so my, I come from a slightly different perspective in that out of high school, I, my, my, uh, my life was that I was a professional musician and I did not initially go to a four-year college. I went to a music conservatory for six years, uh, for six months or so, ended up dropping out and then getting a liberal arts degree. Uh, but still I never, even when I was at Columbia, I, um, I never, you know, to, to, to this day, almost every one of my close friends is still a musician. So who, who didn't go to a traditional college who either went to a conservatory uh, of some kind or didn't go to college at all. And that, because that happened to be my passion, I view it as pretty normal to be into something that is not academics. And I think there are plenty of people, for, you know, college is not for them. Um, but we do have this kind of worship of college as the end goal of, you know, of, of the first 18 years of life, right? It, it is the measure of whether you've succeeded as a teenager and as a, as a young adult. And I think that's, that's not something that exists everywhere in the world. And it's something we should definitely reconsider. Yeah. And I would also say, and this is another major plank of the book that I think it's important is, um, college, the college wage advantage depends a great deal on the scarcity of the college, uh, degree. If we were were to succeed in getting everybody a degree, the college wage advantage would disappear. I mean, I'm not just making this up. I'm not just saying, reasoning this out from first principles. So there's a paper from the National uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, really uh, uh, fantastic uh, document. Wish I could remember who wrote it, but um, it looked at the college wage premium, I want to say from 1890 to 2005. Okay, so the entirety of the 20th century plus some on either side. So, you know, the college wage premium, when we say that it's just, you know, the amount that the average college graduate is making relative to the average person who didn't go to college. Um, and they found that to a remarkable degree, and that's their words, <laughs> remarkable degree, um, the college wage premium is simply a function of the number of jobs that require a college degree and the number of people with uh, with those degrees, mm-hmm. the degree holders. In other words, when there are more jobs for people with college degrees, uh, then the value goes up. When there's more people with degrees to fill those jobs, the value goes down. Mm-hmm. Couldn't be simpler, right? Supply and demand. It's 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 uh, sort of the most basic and essential economic law. Um, but if we think about that, right, then it makes the whole sort of everyone should go to college policy assumption kind of crazy, right? Because it means that um, we're simply pushing more and more and more people into the pipeline. That means that there's more and more and more people graduating from college who are then going to compete with each other on the labor market. Okay? So I, I write sometimes about the idea of a, um, uh, <coughs> a practical college major. And one of the points I make is that what is practical is actually not like intuitively easy to figure out. Um, a good example is business. Um, So is a business degree a practical major? To many people, it sounds like the ultimate practical major. Hey, it's business. You're going to go work at a business. This is a useful skill. Here's the issue, though. Um, Business majors do all right when we look at the big picture numbers, but they only do all right. And a lot of people would assume they do better than all right. But a big part of the reason why they only do all right is we're graduating 350,000 of them a year, right? So if you are a business major coming up onto the job market, you are in a sea of other business majors who have the same degree, right? So you are necessarily going to have headwinds in terms of finding a job because there's such a supply of people who look just like you to an employer. There's a good illustration of this from a a decade or so ago was in pharmacy, which is um, that... uh, there was a, a sense that pharmacy was a good job, and it is a good job, 
um, with good pay and that it was a, a, a good port in a storm uh, e uh, economically, that uh, the pharmacists tended to be uh, recession proof positions and that it was an enviable you know, um, <laughs> job that sort of carries with it some white collar respectability, et cetera. Um, well, what ended up happening was that in the span of a decade, and there's a great uh, new uh, Republic article about this, in the span of about a decade, um, literally over 100 new schools of pharmacy were opened in the United States. Just dozens and dozens of schools of pharmacy were opened in the United States. Um, and what ended up happening to those graduates? Well, of course, the, the sort of the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow got harder to attain because all those new schools and all those new graduates meant they had more people to compete against on the labor market. Now, I'm not saying somebody coming out onto the labor market as a young pharmacist was suddenly in bad shape compared to the national picture. I'm sure that they, they did fine overall. But the very act of trying to dramatically scale up the number of people getting that degree inherently made it more of a dicey prospect. So one of the things I tell people all the time is, you know, um, you have to be careful about your intuitive sense about what's a good um, major to get. So like a, a classic story was, um, there was a time when everyone was saying, become a petrochemical engineer, right? And then the oil market, uh, was submarine a while back. Uh, and the price of crude went down a, tr a tremendous deal. And so all of a sudden it didn't seem like that good of a job anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously, number one, you want to make yourself nimble and you want to make yourself someone who is marketable in various different degrees. But what does what happens when you're telling everybody to go to college and everybody needs that credential and you find that uh oops now i'm on the market everybody already uh, in my age seems to already have a degree right um i have so much competition well what do you do well you get another degree and that's how we see the insane explosion in master's degrees um over the past decade or decade and a half i encourage everyone listening to do a Google image search for master's degrees over time. And it's just this, if it was a stock, it would have made people super rich, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, and there's just been an explosion in it because people feel, okay, the college credential is no longer sufficient to make me stand out in the market. Now I need to go get another credential. And if we keep it, keep doing the same thing that we're doing, it's going to be another new credential.